Good evening. My name is Iris Bonnet. I'm the academic dean here at the Harvey Kennedy School. Tonight, it's my distinct honor to welcome our speaker and our special guest, Mr. Jay Walder. In fact, it's a welcome back, back to the Kennedy School where he served on our faculty and also graduated from the MPP program in 1983. Jay joins us today as the distinguished guest speaker, the 2013 Gustav Pollack Lecturer. Before I share a bit more information on Jay's distinguished career, let me thank those who made this evening possible. Thank you to the Institute of Politics, the Taubman Center for State and Local Government, and the Rappaport Institute for Greater Boston for all of their work. I'd also like to specially acknowledge a number of our faculty members here who've been teaching with Jay when he was here and were close colleagues at the time, Jack Donahue, Tony Gomez-Sibanes, and Steve Kelman. Now let me say a few words about the Pollock Lecture. The Gustav Pollock Lecture on Research in Government was founded in 1951 as a memorial to journalist Gustav Pollock, who wrote for the nation and other publications in the early 20th century. This lecture was designed to, and I'm quoting, to stimulate interest in government careers by providing an opportunity for public officials and researchers to discuss their work with a view to building a better government. How fitting, of course, for the mission of our school. Previous Pollock lectures have included James Schlesinger, Vernon Jordan, Hanan Ashravi, Paul Farmer, and Dr. Sugata Bose. Tonight's speaker could not be a more perfect fit for this particular lecture tonight. Mr. Walder has built a distinguished international career in the public transportation sector which includes 30 years working in the rail industry in the United States and in the United Kingdom. He is a true cosmopolitan, as you will hear in just a moment. He's also been described as an exceptionally, and I'm again quoting, exceptionally skillful and successful policy entrepreneur. And as a model for cross-sectoral careers, having worked across all sectors in government, business, and the non-for-profit sector. Jay began his career in 1983 at the New York Metropolitan Transportation Authority, holding various positions until 1995. Then we were lucky enough to have him here at the Kennedy School as a lecturer from 95 to 2001, during which time he also spent uh, teaching at National University of Singapore. Between 2001 and 2007, Mr. Walder was a Managing Director for Finance and Planning at Transport for London, where he was credited with the introduction of the successful and popular Oyster Card, and with leading the development and transportation plans for London's successful bid for the 2012 London Olympics. He also created the world's first congestion pricing system. Those of you, many I know are MVP students yourself, certainly something that you will learn about in one of your classes. In 2009, he returned to the MTA in New York, where he became the chairman and chief executive officer, and he stayed until 2011. In 2011, Jay Walder joined the Mass Transit Railway Corporation in Hong Kong, where he currently serves as the chief executive officer. The MTR is regarded as one of the world's leading railway operators. The company is building on its success in its home base of Hong Kong with a growing portfolio of rail and property related operations, also in the mainland of China, in Europe and in Australia. And I just learned from Jay before that it's also one of the few railway systems across the world which is on time 99.9% .9 of the time <laughs> which as a Swiss, I value extremely. <laughs> in addition, and I'm sure Jay will tell us more about this in a moment, it is also extremely profitable, something that very, very few railway um, organizations can say. So Jay has a most remarkable career, 
and has helped lead three of the largest and most um, complicated public transport systems in the world, in London, in New York, and in Hong Kong. He understood, growing up in Queens, that convenient, reliable public transportation is critical, and particularly critical for such enormous cities such as New York, his hometown, London, and Hong Kong. Without further ado, you're in for a treat. Enjoy the wisdom that Jay has to share with us. We're very honored to have you here tonight, Jay. Um, I'm rarely speechless, but I must admit that I'm, I'm a bit overwhelmed by the introduction, so thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much, and, and also, for, for the honor of, of speaking in the forum. Um, this is truly, truly a special place uh, to, to be speaking about public service. And um, when I had the opportunity to do this lecture, um, I, I jumped at it. it was, it's very, very special. Um, I was here as a student. I was here as a faculty member. I, I was in the forum so many times. And I always appreciated the, the ability to come here and, and be able to listen and, and learn from people who were here. Um, of course, time has moved on, technology has moved on. Uh, you don't actually have to be in the forum anymore to, to, to listen to people in the forum. Um, I think of that as a bit of a double-edged sword because now there are people in Hong Kong, China, Australia, the UK, and Sweden watching to see what I'm doing today. So, um, so uh, let me also take an opportunity to, to say thank you to so many friends who I see out in the audience today, um, uh, people that uh, have been friends and colleagues of mine going back to the days that I was a student here. Uh, and, and that now feels like a very long time ago, so uh, uh, doing that. So um, what I'd like to, to really uh, touch upon today um, is really about the fact that the world is getting increasingly urban. Um, you probably have seen all the statistics, but let me just offer them up just so you, we're all on the same page about this. Uh, the World Health Organization projects that 70% of the world's population will be in cities by the year 2050. That's up from about 50% today. And if that happens, that means that the actual number of people living in cities will double in just the next 35 years. Now, other people, um, I might note Ed Glazer is here today. He has very eloquently made this point, uh, have made all the points about why cities are important um, for the environment, for innovation, for economic development. And I think that's all true. Uh, I don't really want to touch that. Uh, but I'd like to take uh, a much more parochial view of cities, if I may. And, and I'd like to say that cities are great for public service, that, that cities are built on public service, from infrastructure to education to health care. Uh, they are the laboratories to try new ideas, um, to implement policies and programs that literally change people's lives on a grand scale. And they provide an opportunity to learn from others and share what works and share what doesn't work. Um, but we also recognize that urbanization brings huge challenges. I mean, how do we provide 21st century public service to billions, literally billions, of new urbanites in a way that's sustainable? Because if we think about what we're doing right now, we will live or die, the success of this experiment will, will live or die on the quality of the public services that we provide. Uh, we simply cannot support the density that, that is envisioned in the cities of, of the 21st century without efficient and effective public services uh, to provide for the basic needs. And, and if we think about a step further with that, uh, as density increases, uh, the importance of delivering those services increases exponentially because the downside of bad service is so extreme to us. 
Now, I have had the good fortune of attacking uh, public service issues from a number of different angles in my 30-year career. Uh, I've worked in the public sector on two continents, three different occasions. Uh, I've worked in the not-for-profit sector right here at the, at the Kennedy School. And I stand before you today as the CEO uh, of a private company that delivers public service. I can tell you that I think this is the most exciting time that I've ever experienced for public service. Um, the, the, the relentless urbanization of our planet is creating opportunities for creative thinking and new approaches. And this is not about the public sector or the private sector or the nonprofit sector. It's cutting across all sectors. The challenge that I think is there is how to find the ways to capture the enormous wealth and economic activity that urbanization is generating. And the question that we might ask is how do we put it uh, to work supporting the infrastructure and the public systems that make it all possible in the first place? Uh, what I've noticed is that cities all around the world now uh, are throwing away the old playbook. Uh, the status quo isn't good enough if you want to deliver both the quantity and the quality of, of services that these larger and larger human communities demand. Um, so people are looking for new partners, they're looking for new ways to be able to, to create sustainable models. Uh, and when I say sustainable, I mean both environmentally, certainly, but, but also financially as well. Uh, and I think that's a very good thing. Um, my business is public transportation. So uh, as I thought about illustrating some of this, uh, I hope you'll bear with me. I'm gonna use transport as the illustration of this, but I, I actually believe that the, the point that I will make applies much more broadly than, than, than just uh, transport. Uh, I will try and keep it brief, and I will be very happy and, and hope to engage a great dialogue with everyone that's here. So let me start from what I, I will call my current station, which is at the MTR Corporation in Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong, a, a city that has always been a little bit ahead of the curve when, when you think about, about how to make urbanization sustainable. Um, uh, you stole my thunder, but, but within the international passenger railway community, um, NTR is known for two things. First, we consistently provide 99% 0.9% on-time performance. I checked it out, by the way. Uh, it's 99.93. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, that's one thing. But the second thing, and I think that the, the second part, is that the company turns a profit. It is one of only a handful of passenger rail companies uh, anywhere in the world that does this. And so if you were designing an ideal model, if you were thinking about starting with a, with a clean, uh, sheet of paper, perhaps this is the best that you could actually hope for. A company that is providing the highest level of public service and is actually doing it with efficient use of public resources uh, at the same time. So uh, the, the question that that might raise is, is how does this work? I mean, how is MTR able to achieve such extraordinary results as, as a private company without compromising public interest? And um, I think the, the answer to that question really lies in capturing the value that I mentioned uh, a moment ago. We all know, we all accept that infrastructure creates enormous public value. Um, it creates public value as a societal good. It's a driver of very tangible uh, economic production. We certainly could not imagine the large complex cities that we have today uh, without public transit, for example. Um, and, and we also recognize that transit uh, investments and operations generate a benefit that extends well beyond the people who are on that train uh, or, or that bus. And that's been the long-standing dialogue and debate right here in the US as well as in the, in the rest of the world. How do you capture that value that is actually being created out of the transit system? So uh, the difficulty has been that that externality, and yes, I am a policy wonk, I'll use that word, the externality um, that is generated by, by the transit investments just don't flow back into the transit system. Transit providers invest billions of dollars uh, in new infrastructure, but there is no financial model in most of the cases to be able to capture the benefit that is actually being uh, created. 
And the inevitable result of that is underinvestment. That's what we generally see today. Why? Why does that happen? It says, so the, the, the failure, I think, is that if the, if the infrastructure is not self-sustaining, then, then the reality is that it cannot rely on public funding always being there. At some point, politics simply diverts the money elsewhere. Um, and you might say it doesn't have to be that way, but that's just the reality of the case. When, when transit competes with other public needs, it doesn't have a way to be able to achieve the investment uh, that it needs. And so that's why I will argue that it's so important to find sustainable models uh, uh, for, for the investment that we need. Now, the development of Hong Kong's rail system uh, has largely been supported by the granting of development rights uh, for the properties that are adjacent to the railway. And I'm going to stop here for a second and be very, very clear about this. These are rights. These are not free land. Uh, the company has to pay the government for the value of the land on the basis that the, the railway had not been built. So the pre-development value of that land. The result is that the company does develop that land after the railway is built, and it takes that appreciation in land value uh, for its means. And in that way, the property and the, the increase in the value of the property becomes a proxy for the broader public benefit uh, and aligns the financial basis with the societal benefit uh, that is being created. And, and it also ensures that, that subject to, to normal business risks, whatever those are, um, that the corporation has the proper resources, not just to be able to build a rail line, but also to be able to operate it, maintain it, and renew the systems and equipment uh, over time. That's all well and good. But it, but it really wouldn't be worth very much if you believe that somehow the public good was being lost in the process that I just described. And I will relate to you a conversation I had with a friend of mine recently. My, my friend asked me the other day if MTR would build a new rail line if it wasn't profitable. Would we do it? Um, and and his, his implication was that, that Hong Kong would underinvest in rail transport because the corporation is legally obligated to work to the best interest of the shareholders rather than working to the best interest of the public. And so his view was that a narrow financial basis that the corporation would be working on was simply not appropriate for a corporation that was providing such a critical public service to be there. OK, fair question. Um, my response was that we would certainly not build a rail line that was not sustainable sustainable environmentally, sustainable financially, sustainable in the performance uh, that, that we want to have. Um, and that sustainable point is not just about building it, but it's also about operating it and maintaining it and having the money to renew those assets um, over time. And, and my point would be, as if you look at that, um, I don't think that that's only in the corporation's best interest. I actually think that's in the best interest of the communities that are along that rail line. Uh, why should anyone want it to be a different way? Why should we want to build and operate a public service that we know could not be sustained over the long term? And if it's not sustained, how likely is it that that public benefit will actually be realized? Now, I am not saying in any way that, that there's anything wrong with our infrastructure supporting other policy objectives. Uh, if a society wants to offer discounted fares for seniors or for students, um, that's perfectly fine. It's great. Um, if building a rail line to a low-income community uh, will help to be able to improve economic equity, then, in fact, there's an argument that should be done but there's also a need to find a way to fill the funding gap. We shouldn't confuse the public value that flows from the broader pol policy objectives with the public value that flows from the effective delivery of the public service. 
the transit provider's corporate responsibility should be delivering an efficient, reliable, effective service. That's what the responsibility of the transit provider should do. It's the government's responsibility to provide for other needs as it sees fit. And the corporate model simply provides a transparency to this. Uh, it allows you to separate these things out so that the broader objectives don't hurt our ability to build and maintain and operate infrastructure sustainably. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not standing here to say to you that the MTR's corporate model uh, is, is a silver bullet. It's certainly not. And, and many people that I speak with say to me that, that what we're doing in Hong Kong is unique to Hong Kong. It can only exist there. You can't take it some other place. It was put in place at the creation of the metro system. The, the government controls all the land. Property values are, are sky high. So clearly you can do it here, but you can't do it um, anywhere else. And, and maybe. I appreciate the points that, that, that people make when they say that, uh, but I think that's taking a far too narrow view of what's actually happening uh, in Hong Kong today. Um, it's not about the specific model. Uh, the point is that, that Hong Kong has identified a way to support the urbanization and the density we want by sharing the benefits of the economic activity that it creates. Think of it from that perspective. That's relevant to any city around the world that's experiencing uh, unprecedented growth. Now, we can joke about the fixation in, in Hong Kong, maybe in Switzerland as well, with 99.9% with on-time performance. But the reality is that Hong Kong simply could not work without that level of performance. You couldn't support the density that's built above the rail line. Um, and, and really, what it came down to was that the people in Hong Kong had to get it right. It was the only way to make the city function, and so they figured out uh, how to be able to do that. But Hong Kong isn't the only city that's facing that imperative. Again, remember the cities that we are, that we are reaching and, and coming to. Every growing city is going to have to grapple with this phenomenon uh, in its own way. And the consistent theme that I would say out of this is that we need to keep reinventing and we need to embrace new ideas. Now, this is already happening in mainland China. Um, I have been in Hong Kong for a little under two years. I will put my hand up and say I am no, by no means a China expert, not by, a, not by a long shot. But I have had the vantage point of watching what they are doing, uh, at least from close by. And nowhere in the world is urbanization happening more forcefully than it is happening uh, in China today. The Chinese government is accelerating the construction of 20,000 miles of railway to support the rapid growth of its cities. But it has also recognized that this cost of being able to do this, alongside the other fiscal demands that it has, it can't possibly pay for it itself. So just a few months ago, China's highest governing body, the State Council, announced plans to reform the way the country finances its railways. Traditionally in China, city and provincial governments have always funded transport infrastructure in their entirety. But they're now aggressively bringing in private capital, they're now bringing in private operators. And they're being encouraged to integrate the rail and the land development, not surprisingly, along the lines of what we do uh, in Hong Kong. So you can imagine how much of a change this is uh, for that society, but the leadership of China now has understood that if they're going to reach their objectives, they had to think beyond the old ways that they were doing things and find new means of being able to do that. I can't tell you that this has been an easy process. Um, MTR is now working on two rail-related property developments in China, um, in the mainland of China. Um, the first one, which is in Shenzhen, uh, just across the boundary from, from Hong Kong, uh, took nearly a decade of negotiation with the Chinese government at every level of government that you could imagine. Eventually, we were able to get the property rights uh, to do this. That was a big moment. But I think what was really exciting about it 
is that the second development, which is in Tianjin, took only one year to be done. And in this case, the government came to us to ask us whether we would do that. Clearly, they are focused uh, and changing the system and opening the door to private investment uh, and willing to make the paradigm shift. And they're recognizing that this is not just a financial transaction. The reality is that better integrating the land with the transport systems fits with a more sustainable and environmentally friendly pattern of urban development. Um, and again, much like I would say about Hong Kong, the imperative of density is what's causing them to be able to expand the thinking and to be able to innovate. If we turn to the West, the, the growth may not be as exponential as what we see in, in the East, but the same kind of ideas are actually taking root in Europe as well. Uh, on the way here last week, I stopped in Stockholm, uh, a city where MTR operates the metro system under a franchise agreement uh, with the government. Now, I have to admit, frankly, that I had not realized until I began discussions there that Stockholm is the fastest growing major city in all of Europe. And, and probably not surprisingly, they're grappling with exactly the same question. How do they create the transport? How do they create the housing that they need to meet this, prop, this, this population growth uh, that's there? Now, of course, I, I'm not suggesting that Stockholm will rival Shanghai as, a, as a, a large city. That's not the point. But my point is that they're finding exactly the same challenge in a very, very different environment, and they're opening the door to the same type of, of thinking. Uh, Stockholm, uh, Sweden, a city and a country uh, that has a relatively high tax rate, uh, admittedly not as high as it was a little while ago, um, and it's, it's focused on excellent public services. But, but even in a city like Stockholm, they are concerned about their ability to be able to build the infrastructure they need and their question about whether they can afford to be able to do it. Uh, I spent two days going around the city of Stockholm meeting with many, many people there, and everybody wanted to talk to me about Hong Kong's rail plus property model. Now, I don't want to suggest that they believed you could simply pick that model up and transplant it to Stockholm. You're not going to bring 50-story towers and, and bring them to, to Stockholm. But they saw the potential to adapt it, to, to take out some of the key ingredients of this model and say, how do we bring it to a city like Stockholm to meet the needs that, that they believe are there and that they're grappling with? And I think this is the, the key point. Everywhere that you look, global cities are experimenting with new ideas um, to meet the pressure of growth and urbanization. The situations may be a little bit different in New York and London, for example, um, but I think the lesson is really the same. Uh, in those cities, aging transit systems have been revived. Work has been done over the last 30 years to be able to do that. Um, but you know something? People don't really care today about how much better the transit system is than it was 30 years ago. The people in those cities are asking a very simple question. Is the system, is the infrastructure able to meet the needs that I have for the way I want to live my life today? And actually, that's really the right question when you think about it. What I'm impressed by is that more and more, the cities are coming up with the right answer. Um, when I was in London, the city was overwhelmed with traffic. If you looked at the polling uh, that, that was coming through at the time that the first directly elected mayor of London was, was, was being done, transportation was the number one issue. It was ahead of crime, it was ahead of education, it was ahead of health care, it was ahead of housing, all the usual suspects. Transportation. Uh, was the number one issue. So in response, we implemented the congestion pricing system in London. Now, this was a hugely unpopular idea, but we believed in its sustainability. You had the, you had the opportunity to be able to reduce traffic and invest in the bus system uh, at the same time. And, and history has said that it's been a huge success. 
And it's another reminder that people in a city will respond when you deliver better services. I think there's a similar story that's taking place in New York right now. Um, I stopped in New York earlier uh, this weekend uh, to visit my son and to catch up with some friends and, and colleagues uh, in New York. Uh, so I met my son in the East Village. And my next meeting my, was an appointment that I had in Lower Manhattan. Now, historically, there is no great way to get between those two places. You could take a very slow bus. You could walk. You could take a taxi. Um, but this time, for the very first time, I hopped on a city bike. And I rode city bike there. And, and I have to say that it's hard to overestimate how successful city bike has been in New York. And it's easy uh, to forget all the skepticism that it's faced. This has not just been a program about installing bike racks and installing bicycles. Um, it's really been a program about a decade of installing bike lanes and creating a bike-friendly city that could finally be in a position to be able to support this type of program. Now, um, I know what you're thinking. Am I suggesting somehow that a bike share program is, is somehow the answer to sustainable transportation for a city of 8 million people? No, I'm not, I am not saying that at all. But you know something? Congestion pricing was not the answer to all of London's transportation problems either. Uh, what they are is indicative of a new way of thinking. Um, and I think that thinking is catching on everywhere. They don't even have to be brand new ideas. Um, both congestion pricing and bike share programs have been implemented in other places. What these cities did, London and New York and many other places, is they're adapting these programs to a local context. Um, and they're creating um, and they're changing the game in the cities. And I think it's that approach and I think it's that attitude that leads me to believe that even bigger and bigger ideas can be adapted in these cities. And maybe we can even take the Hong Kong rail plus property model uh, and bring it to some of our older cities as well. So um, I promise to try to keep this short, and I will. And let me, let me try and close, if I can, on, on a little bit of a, a personal note. Uh, Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, recently looked back at the career plan that he had developed when he was taking a business school class. His conclusion, total failure. He diverged from his intended path within 18 months. And nothing else that was written on that sheet of paper was accurate. Now, I think you could probably say that Mr. Cook has done pretty well for himself. But his point was that we can predict what's going to happen. The world is changing, and we have no idea what it will mean for each of us. His advice was always to have a North Star, and that you'll end up in the right place. For me, that North Star has been public service. As a kid growing up in public housing in Queens, I could not have imagined in my wildest dreams that I'd be working today in China. I couldn't have predicted moving from New York to Cambridge to London, back to New York, on to Hong Kong. And even if I had wanted that to be my journey, it would have been truly impossible to plan. As a colleague and a friend here at the Kennedy School described it to me, he said that I've been consistent in mission, but opportunistic in action. I liked it. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> um, it's always been about finding opportunities to do something that's new and innovative, even though the challenges have been very, very different. Frankly, the challenge of leading a transit system that runs 99.9% .9 on time is very different from the challenge of leading a transit system that's grappling with the worst financial crisis in, in the last 50 years, which is very different from figuring out how to deal with traffic congestion in London uh, at the time that that was happening as well. Um, so, so the reality is that the challenges have been all different. Yet in every case, for me, there was a chance to experiment. And there was a feeling that urban growth and technology open the door to be able to do new things. Whether it's, it's apps to give people real-time information 
uh, on, on the transit system, whether it's congestion pricing uh, that we're doing to get cars off the road. And I believe that these opportunities are becoming more and more prevalent as our urban population grows. Answers that were once etched in granite are now written in a erasable marker. We can change them. So yes, I think that our urban future is about the environment, it's about economic opportunity, it's about so many other things. And there are a lot of hard things that we have to get right. And there are a lot of ways for us to go wrong. But for us, all of us here, all of us in this room, those of us who have been shaped by this great institution, for people who really care about public service, I would also say that now is an amazing time to make a difference. Thank you very much. With that, we're happy to take questions. There are four mics, two on the ground floor here, and one on the first floor, another one on the first floor. And you should please line up behind the mic. And the ground rules are that you should start by introducing yourself, then ask one question, and the question is something that ends with a question mark. Thank you very much. We'll start right here. Easy questions first. <laughs> Hello, my name is Carlos, I am from Mexico City. I was mayor in Guajimalpa, one of the districts within the Mexico City area. And uh, first of all, congratulations and thank you for coming. It was very interesting and congratulations on your achievement. I'm an MP, MPA student in the Mason Fellowship. And I have a question, in Mexico, if I, the past 10 years, uh, the mayors have been uh, building more the rapid transit bus systems instead on, on building more rails for the metro. And I believe that that was not the right decision. In fact, I, will, I, will I was always fighting in the Congress for uh, getting more money for the railways. But uh, always the, the answer was that, or the excuse was that it was too much more expensive to build infrastructure with rails than constructing the uh, bus system, right? the rapid transit system. So I would like to know what's your, your vision on this? Is it too expensive for countries like Mexico who is struggling with money, with a budget? Is it better for our countries to build uh, bus systems or the rail systems? Thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know enough, frankly, uh, about the circumstance in Mexico to, to answer directly what, what's actually happening uh, in Mexico. But I would say that <clears throat> I believe that, that there are, is a wide range of public transit investments that can be made. And there are certainly examples around the world where bus rapid transit is working very effectively to be able to support uh, development. Um, I, I think the point that I would make about this is if we can find a way to be able to capture the value that's actually being created and think of it as a virtuous circle, then it begins to solve some of the argument that, or some of the concern <clears throat> that, you're, that you're hearing. So I think that's really the challenge that, that, that comes into that and your belief in the, in the value that's going to be created uh, as a result of doing it. But I, I certainly wouldn't dismiss bus rapid transit. I think it uh, done well and in a number of cities. It has worked exceptionally well. And, I, and I, I, again, I don't know enough about the specifics of the location that, that you're in. Yes, uh, hi, I'm Josh Harder. I'm a third year joint degree MBA student and, and public policy student here at the Kennedy School. And my question is precisely about that value capture that you alluded to that MTR does so well at. Um, how realistic is it for other transport systems, be it kind of mass rail or any other type of transportation system that is currently underfunded in terms of infrastructure, how realistic is it for those sorts of organizations to adopt a, a value capture model similar to MTR? And what are the main barriers that you see in uh, other organizations uh, adopting that? I actually believe it's very dual. I don't think there's anything that, that is in, it's not like the laws of gravity that, that you can't do it. Um, there are in various places 
barriers that we've put up to do that, but those barriers are, again, movable and changeable in, in, in thinking about it. Um, I will give you an example right now, which is that um, in New York City, we are building the Second Avenue subway. Um, I actually think it's terrific we're building the Second Avenue subway. It's a project that was started in the 1960s, um, stopped for, for multiple decades, uh, and, and will happen now, and I think that's great. It's a three and a half billion dollar investment to be able to build that rail line. And, and the question is, will it create a tremendous amount of value? I think no doubt it will create a tremendous amount of value. Will it reshape the east side of Manhattan, the upper east side of Manhattan? Yes, it will reshape the upper east side of Manhattan. But we don't have any mechanism to capture that back. And so we're sitting here today as we're making progress on the first phase of the Second Avenue subway, wondering about how we fund the second phase and how we fund the third phase and how we keep this, keep this going. And there's nothing in the model that actually says to us that there's a way to be able to, to do that and to capture that value and to bring it back. Now, is it easy and am I oversimplifying it? Yes, I'm oversimplifying it and no, it's not easy. But it is doable to be able to think about how we do these things and how we bring that value back. And, and my point would be, not only would we be getting the Second Avenue subway that we're getting right now, but actually we'll be getting the Second Avenue subway we ultimately want, which is one that goes all the way from downtown to the, to the Bronx, rather than a short piece of what's there. We have to change our way of thinking about, about doing these things and find ways of being able to, to bring that in and letting the, the, the value that's being created, at least in part, at least in part, support that infrastructure that is so important to us for what we are doing. And, 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 and I think we need to find a way to change the dialogue from being a question of should the gas tax go up by another five cents or 10 cents to one particularly for urban areas in which we capture that value uh, in a different way. Please, right there. Um, hi, my name is Skylar Berland, um, and I'll be asking the official Twitter question from the JFK Junior Forum tonight. So the question is, what aspects um, from your experience working in Hong Kong do you think can be applied to New York City? And I also have a quick personal question to add on to that. Um, being from New York City, um, it does seem kind of every time I return from school back to New York that the prices are always rising um, to use the subway or whether to use the trains, things like that. Um, what's your view in terms of the privatization of mass transit systems and the cost not just for the companies to build these systems, but then for the people who have to use them on a daily basis. For the record, I was not the one who did the last fare increase in New York. <laughs> <laughs> just, just for the record. Um, I, I think what you're seeing on our transit systems is a real policy choice uh, for our society right now. To what extent do we want to support the tra The transit system needs to be supported. To what extent do we want to support it by, by having the users of that system pay for the services through fares? To what extent do we want to support it by, by taking other governmental resources to be able to do that? And that, that's a question that's on the table for us. By the way, it's a question that's on the table in many, many places in, in doing it. Um, the, the fare increases um, and the cost uh, are barely meeting the cost of providing the services that are there right now. And, and yet, if we look at the transit systems, again, I will make an argument that all we have seen year in and year out now is that we feel even more strongly that we need these transit systems to support the cities that we're in. I think it's the same story in Boston. I think it's a story in Chicago. I think it's a story in New York. I think it's a story all over the country. Even cities like Los Angeles, which at one time had nothing to do with transit, are now saying, how do I get a transit system? And actually, people are voting to pay for that transit system to be able to do that. So, so I think we're seeing that foundation in a way to do it. And I think it, it is something that um, you know, we have to make a societal choice about how we're doing that. My other point about this, though, is if we could find the way to capture directly some of this value, then that would, take, that would relieve some of the burden of what we are doing. Um, and and uh, you know, I don't know that it's directly comparable but the average fare in Hong Kong is just over $1 US. So, so you know, there is, there is the point that says by, by finding these means to be able to do it, by bringing in the values that are being captured, 
by creating the commercial opportunities that are there, we've been able to run a, a high quality public transit system um, without public subsidy and at a price that, at least by international standards, would be considered comparatively low. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kunal and I'm a first year student at HBS. Uh, thank you for your insightful talk. I uh, guess my question is, uh, you worked in New York, London, and Hong Kong. Uh, during your experiences in these three cities, are there particular kind of political leaders or political systems that you've come across that are best attuned towards uh, transit development in either of these cities? And if yes, what kind are they? I, I will tell you a story of the first time that I met Ken Livingston. Ken Livingston was, was elected mayor of London in um, May of 2000. <clears throat> I was a professor uh, lecturer here at the Kennedy School at the time, and I was, I was being asked whether I would like to go over and help run the transport system in, in London, and uh, I took the opportunity, of course, <clears throat> to want to meet with the mayor. And um, we met for about an hour. He was charming, as you might expect that, that he would be. And, and, and shortly before the end of that conversation, he turned to me and he said, it would be terrific if you come here, but I just want you to know, don't come unless you are prepared to implement the congestion pricing system in my first term. <laughs> and, and he had defined this. He basically said, chips in, all chips in, it's not a question about it. He had defined it and said, this is what he wanted to do. He said, it's what I believe in. He said, I'm not sure it's good politics. And he said that to me. But he said, it's what I believe in, and it's what I wanted to do. Now, I don't always agree with every one of Ken's political directions. I'm not trying to make that argument uh, by, by, by any means. But I have an enormous amount of respect for the fact that he was elected. He said he campaigned on this. He wanted to do it, chips in. And, and my job, working with others, was to get it done. And if I wasn't prepared to do that, he was prepared to say, please don't come. I, I have enormous respect for that view. Hi, uh, my name is Niyong. I'm from Singapore. I'm from the MPID program. Um, I, have, I have a question about leadership in an Asian context. So you have spent the bulk of your career in the West, um, in New York, and then in London, and you went over to Hong Kong. Like, how, how, how do you navigate the cultural sensitivities of leading in an Asian organization where people may be used to a less direct form of communication. So like for example, like you know the HPS style, if someone is not performing well, like you tell the guy straight up. Like in Asia, you, you probably, you know, might want to exercise a little bit more um, courtesy, I don't know, or, or uh, maybe more indirect approach when, 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 when you tell someone things that they don't want to hear. So this might, particularly might be difficult if you are dealing with the authorities who might be not so receptive to criticisms. So like given their confusion background, so how do you deal with that? I'm just curious. Thank you. I don't know how to answer this question. <laughs> Very carefully. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think you can't miss the fact that if you're going to take the position that I've taken in, in the corporation, both for the, for the management of the corporation and for the, the relationships that you have to have in the broader community, the business community, the governmental community, et cetera, um, that you do have to work very carefully at doing it. Um, but, but I would say there are two other parts to it that have, that have really carried me in, in doing this. Uh, one is respect. Um, you know, I was brought into a transit system that deserves a tremendous amount of respect. It's operating at the highest levels um, anywhere in the world. And, and um, I had to make sure in everything that I was doing, and I do it every single day, that I respect the people who are, who are running that system. We may disagree on things, and we may debate things, and we may move, and we may try and change some of that, but, but respect is at the heart of what, uh, of what is there. And by the way, uh, that extends all the way through. It's not just our corporation. Um, the decisions that were taken 35, 40 years ago to set the MTA up, the MTR up the way it is set up were fantastic decisions. Um, I've inherited that. 
But I didn't create it. I didn't do it. Other people did it. The governmental people who were there at the time figured that out. Um, and, we, and one has to be sensitive to it. The, the second point I'd say, um, and, and it's been a big part of what I've tried to do, is, is keep my ears open. Listen. Um, again, it sounds pat in, in doing it, but uh, it, it was, it's been usually important to me to listen to people, to go around. Um, in my business, I ride the trains all the time. Some people have come up to me and said, you've been on the trains more than all the other CEOs combined. And, and I said, well, I don't think I have a choice. I need to do this. I need to understand this. I need to see this. I need to will it. And I want people to see me there doing that as well. Um, and, and I, you know, people, some of our own staff come up to me and, and, and shake my hand and say, I'm so happy to see you in the transit system. And that's the way you actually win the, the hearts and minds of the people who were there. We have time for three more questions, so I'm going to go around and end with you. Next question, please. Hi, uh, my name is Lyle Sakawe. I'm a first year in the Master in Public Policy program here at the Kennedy School. And um, one of the things that I think is most interesting about your career as a policy entrepreneur is that you've made such interesting leaps, um, sometimes counterintuitive for cert for, and from a certain perspective. So how do you think about evaluating risks when you're thinking about a new opportunity and whether it's something that's in line with your long-term vision? Are you referring to personal risks, or are you referring to, to, to risks for, for a business, for example? Either, I mean, personal. Right. So how do you decide, you know, for example, to leave New York for, to from? Um, you know, I mean, th these are very difficult questions uh, to answer. My wife is here, so I'm going to tell you a story that she's not going to want me to tell you. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, we, in, in, we had come back from Singapore, where I'd spent a, a year in Singapore, and I received a phone call, and uh, it was from uh, Bob Kiley, who'd been the chairman of the MTA and, and was now going to, to run the transportation system in London. And he called and he asked me whether I would, whether I would come to London. Um, when I got off the phone with Bob, my wife was waiting downstairs. And she said, um, she said, what did Bob want? Uh, and I told her. And she said, oh, that's very nice. It's very flattering. What did he say when you said no? <laughs> there, they've been difficult choices to make uh, <laughs> in many, many ways. And, I, and I, can't, I, can't emphasize that. I can't emphasize that enough. And they're phenomenally different than making business decisions. Um, you know, they're, they're, you know, I, I am, you know, I, I am an analytical wonk. I mean, I, I like business decisions that are written down on a piece of paper, that we go through a business case, that we can debate it, that I can question the assumptions and do all those sort of things. I've never found the way to do that when it's your personal life. So, um, uh, and, and so it's, it's incredibly difficult to figure out. Uh, hello, my name is Sita Gofard. Um, I'm a junior at Harvard College, um, and thank you so much. It's, it's a privilege to hear you speak. Um, I actually had the, uh, the honor of taking a class here at Harvard in which we actually studied um, your leadership of the New York MTA um, as well as Hong Kong. Um, and I, I want to ask you about the uh, New York MTA specifically. In 2010, as you know, around that year, um, the, tra your, your, the transportation uh, service in New York came you know, under a huge uh, budget shortfall, and you had to sort of make very tough decisions. Um, about sort of how to, uh, how to, you know, how to better deal with that uh, budget crisis. Um, and one of the issues where you came under most criticism or controversy is your decision to uh, pursue um, sort of a lot of pay cuts or layoffs in the, uh, in the MTA's uh, labor work, in, in the MTA uh, transit union. Uh, how do you defend that? And do you still stand by that decision? You know, I, I think the, the New York situation when I went there, um, and again, the gentleman who asked a moment ago about, about the career choices you make. The career choice in that case was the call that comes from the governor that says, would you like to run the transit system where you started your career in your home state? That's a very difficult offer to say no to. But, but, but actually, Arriving there and finding out that, that the system was in, in truly dire straits um, wasn't the best feeling in the, in the world. Um, within three months of arriving in New York, uh, we realized that we had a $1 billion deficit uh, that was there. Um, it was quite clear that the city and the state, at that time also going through very, very difficult challenges, 
had no money to be able to add to what the MTA was already receiving. And I would say the, um, the mayor, the governor, and, and all of the leaders of the legislature made that very, very clear to me. <laughs> um, this is, welcome aboard, glad that you're here, this is your problem. <laughs> um, and you have to play the hand that you're dealt. Um, the reality of the situation was that we worked very hard to be able to align the, the services that we could provide with the resources that we had to provide those services. Um, in many cases, we were able to do things that, that save public money without having any impact either on the public or on our, um, or our employees. In other cases, we just couldn't do that. Um, we reduced services, bus services and train services, um, uh, and we reduced the number of staff that was in, that was in the organization. Um, I think it fit the context of the time. And uh, I stand by the decisions that we had to take to be able to do that. Uh, I'm very happy to see that the economy is recovering. Uh, I hope the MTA will find a uh, more stable financial footing. I will always be jealous that it wasn't during my time. But, uh, but I think you have to play the hand you were dealt. Last question. Hi, Sorry. my name is Rebecca Haywood. I'm a master's student at MIT in the transportation program. Um, I wanted to bring the conversation quickly back to something you said about that MTR won't build a rail line that isn't profitable and start thinking about how this can apply to cities that are grappling with questions of spatial equity, of social equity. I've spent a lot of time working in the developing world. Um, and how can you start thinking about cities that are trying to grow their transportation systems, but at the same time grappling with governmental, building gov strong governments. What are the, uh, what can you apply from this model and what are some of the things that you can't, is, is that model applicable in these situations that are trying to equalize access to opportunities, social, economic, and things along those lines? Again, I, I would try and go back to, to, to what I said, which was that, that we should look for a way that the transit line can be sustainable, long-term sustainable, both for the construction and the operation and maintenance. Um, I, my belief is that um, robbing Peter to pay Paul doesn't actually help in regard to public services, that, that each piece of what you are doing has to have a sustainable model to be able to, to do that, um, and simply taking from one to the other uh, won't help to be able to do this. The, the beauty of the argument that I'm trying to put forth for cities that are developing is that um, I believe there are a lot of companies, uh, as well as investors, including our company, that are willing to go into cities um, to build the transit as the underlying foundation of the city if they can have a stake in what happens on the way forward, on the outcome that comes as the development of that that's taking place. That's effectively the rail plus property model that Hong Kong has. Um, we will go in and build that work and, and make an investment with the idea that there is a long-term outcome that we will then, that we will then take back. Um, it's very, very applicable to, to developing cities. The second point that I'd make about it is that what makes that model work is connecting the transport infrastructure and the land use. And, and again, my argument would be that should be exactly what we want to do, right? There's no reason why we want the transport infrastructure and the land use to be disconnected from each other. If we could achieve a tighter connection between those two, then we'll achieve the outcomes that we want to have. Hong Kong today has the highest use of public transportation of any city in the world. It has one of the lowest uh, automobile ownership rates of any city in the world, and it has the lowest emission from uh, vehicles uh, of any city in the world. Um, actually, those are some outcomes that, that one can be proud of. Um, and they come as a result of the transportation outcome and the land use outcome being combined. And I think it makes all the sense in the world for, for developing countries. Jay, with that, let me thank you for your insightful remarks uh, on transportation your inspiring comments on leadership and your own career, on the meaning of public service. And we will certainly try to live by your mantra and be guided by our mission and seize the opportunities that present themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you.